29. Good enough. As soon as I saw Liz the next Thursday, all my words about my sister came tumbling out. Wow, said Liz when I was finished. All I had to report was that we ate a lot of pumpkin pie. We were folding a bunch of WEC flyers on the big stone. The flyers were asking people to come out and vote in the December 6th election. Miss Winthrop had dropped them off the night before. I just don't understand how you get so much done, she marveled. I didn't tell her Liz was helping me too. Each time the wind picked up, it blew a few of the flyers across the meadow, and either Liz or I had to run after them. As we folded and stamped all the flyers, I kept talking, telling Liz all about the Chris all about the Christmas float our church was doing. Each time the wind oh sorry. Every year this the Saturday before Christmas, all the churches in town, well, all the white churches, built a float and sent it down Main Street. The mayor voted on the winner, and that church got bragging rights for a whole year. Usually, everyone wanted to ride on the float, and only one or two people were picked. But this year, we had a theme from Matthew nineteen fourteen: Let the children come to me, and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Reverend Mitchell was going to be Jesus, sitting on the throne, and all the kids from the Sunday, from Sunday school were going to be the children. Everyone who wanted to could ride on the float, and I was super excited. You'll come, right? I asked Liz. Marley, I can't. Why not? Someone might recognize me. Can't you wear a disguise? And Liz shook her head. I knew she was right, but I didn't make any sense. But it didn't make it any easier. For the hundredth time, I wish we could go do all the normal things friends do. Go places for fun, have the same circle of friends, eat lunch together at school. How's school going? I asked. I'd been talking so much, I was embarrassed to realize I hadn't even asked about her. Liz grinned. It worked! I got a notebook over Thanksgiving break. I've already written five pages, and that was just yesterday. Today, Shirley asked me why I was scribbling away, but I just wrote my answer down, making sure she couldn't see it. Of course, and after a minute of my not responding, she left to talk to Janet. Maybe they started gossiping about me, and maybe they didn't, but I was just so busy writing about them. I didn't even hear a word. That's great, I said. Tommy will be at the parade, Liz said. I'll tell him to wave at you. I know it's not the same as being there myself, but don't worry about it, I said. It's good enough. After Tuesday afternoons with Liz, I started spending Friday afternoons with Betty Jean. It started when she baked me an extra special triple layer chocolate cake to say thank you for helping with Curtis. Then I did the ironing for her one week to say thank you for the cake. And she baked me a strawberry rhubarb pie to thank me for the ironing. After that, I said, why don't we just help each other out each Friday? And she thought that was a great idea. Betty Jean taught me a lot, starting with the NWACP. That stands for the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. They filed lawsuits and stuff to help Negroes to get more rights. They'd even been part of the Brown versus Board of Education lawsuit that had started this whole integration issue. I told her about the WEC and what we were doing with the election and how there weren't any Negroes in the group. Betty Jean nodded. Heard about that from Mrs. Daisy Bates. Mrs. Bates was, that, was what Betty Jean called an activist. Her husband owned a newspaper, and she spent a lot of time helping the Little Rock Nine last year. I can't say we're thrilled about the no Negroes policy, but Mrs. Bates said Mrs. Terry is a good woman. What I learned most from talking to Betty Jean was that things were complicated. Take starting a private school for the Negroes, for example. The whites had done it with T.J. Rainey. At first, it sounded like a good idea to me, but Betty Jean said the double NAACP had asked the colored community in Little Rock not to do so. Why not? It would be doing what the segregationists wanted, setting up separate schools. Not to mention that it would be betraying the nine Negro students at Central who suffered through last year. What happened to them, I asked. I mean, I know Ernest Green graduated from Minnie Jean Brown and Minnie Jean Brown was expelled, but what about the rest of them? Minnie Jean is still in New York, said Betty Jean. At the school she was invited to attend when she was expelled from Central last year. Carlota, Melba, Thelma, Elizabeth, and Jefferson are all taking correspondence classes. Terrence moved to Los Angeles to live with relatives and go to school there, and Gloria went to Kansas City to do the same. 
You keep working with that WEC, Marley, Betty Jean said. We want to move forward so that Curtis and your friend Liz will have the same opportunities you do, without having to leave town. Yeah, I thought. That sounded pretty good to me. The Christmas Parade. December 6th came and went. Three moderate candidates were elected, Lamb, Tucker, and Matson, and three segregationists, so the school board was deadlocked again. Still, Miss Winthrop managed to put a positive spin on it, and when I saw her as I climbed into the Christmas float, onto the Christmas float. Three is better than none. We'll get there yet, Marley. I nodded. Besides, I've been getting a lot more threatening phone calls, said Miss Winthrop. I think it's a good sign we're making a difference. We, we hadn't got any more calls, thank goodness. Daddy hadn't said a word about it to me, but I had seen him talking to Mr. Haroldson. I remember Daddy saying our neighbor was a member of the Segregationist Capital Citizens Council. He was also working on a party line and probably didn't appreciate being woken up in the middle of the night. Maybe he'd put a stop to our calls. In any case, I didn't want to think about that. Today was a Christmas parade and our float was impressive. There was a little hill built on a low platform, and the whole thing was being pulled by a tractor. The hill was covered with fake grass and flowers, and at the top was a throne. Reverend Mitchell sat in the chair and wore a fake beard and a long white robe. But every time he laughed, he kind of went, ho, 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 and he ended up reminding me more of Santa Claus than Jesus. I settled in... I settled into a spot between a fake bush and a stuffed rabbit. Not sure why there was a rabbit. Maybe it was left over from Easter? Practically everyone from our Sunday school class was there, so it was crowded. There was one space left right next to me. Wonderful! Wonderful! exclaimed Miss Winthrop, clapping her hands. You really do look like the, po like the poor masses. At the last minute... Little Jimmy ran up and sat down next to me. His hair was sticking up in all directions, as if he hadn't combed it. I overslept, he said. Thanks for saving me a seat. I hadn't, but it seemed rude to say, it, to say it, so I just nodded. There was a lurch, and we started off. The crowd got larger and larger as we drove through town. Mother and Daddy were right near the start of the parade, smiling. Mrs. McDaniels and Sally stood next to them. Sally hadn't been selected to ride on, on her church's float. She complained about it for three days straight at school. Still, I waved to her, and she waved back. A little further down the route, I saw Curtis and Betty, Jean, and Pastor George waving so hard, I was afraid their hands would fall off. Next to them was Tommy, and a man and a woman who I guess must be Liz's parents. I waved at them, too. Little Jimmy was waving, was watching me wave at them. Then the truck turned the corner, and they were gone. Little Jimmy leaned over and whispered, JT is saying you're still friends with Liz. I stared at him. Let's see how much time we have left on this. Give me a little bit more. Are you? asked little Jimmy. I shook my head, no. Oh, said little Jimmy. I was hoping it was true. I liked Liz. He pulled his notebook out and found a stub of pencil and started to write. I wanted to tell him it was true, but when I counted two, three, five, seven, what came out instead was, what do you write in there? Words? About what? Things that are too hard to say aloud, said little Jimmy. Maybe I was the one who needed a notebook, not Liz. What are you writing now? Little Jimmy gave me a funny look. I was sure he wasn't going to answer me when he said, how I think you're lying, and that I wish you'd tell her hi for me. My mouth made a little round O. If I run into her, I will, I stammered finally. Thanks, said little Jimmy, and he went back to his writing. I wasn't sure what to think. Now I added little Jimmy to my talking list. He'd accused me of lying, but somehow I still got the feeling that he wanted to be my friend. After all, he'd want warned me about JT. I thought doing JT's homework meant he would keep his mouth shut. I couldn't think of any other way to get to him to be quiet, except to be utterly silent on the topic myself. That way, it seemed only mean... It seemed only like mean-spirited gossip. At least, that was what I hoped. The rest of the parade was ruined by worrying about JT, and when it finally ended, I climbed out. Guess who was waiting for me? Yep, that's right, JT himself.
Congrats, Marley, JT said. The mayor just announced your, your float won first place. I glared at him. What? He said. What did I do? I turned my back to him. Red was across the street, watching a colored man who was cleaning up after the parade, sweeping trash into a pile. When the man was done, he turned to get his dustpan, and while he wasn't looking, Red walked through the pile, kicking his feet until bits of paper and file caps were strewn across the street again. He was humming, White Christmas. You missed the spot, said Red. The man glared at Red once, then slowly started sweeping up the mess. When he was done, Red stepped into the pile again. Like jumping in leaves, he said. Try, JT, it's fun. JT walked into the street and half-heartedly kicked the bottle. Their father, Mr. Dalton, appeared then. He was a large, beefy man who looked like his younger son. If you blew up JT with a bicycle pump to twice his size. Come on, boys, he said. Let's go. His voice was overpowering, like the smell of the schnapps my father sometimes drank after a big meal. Mr. Dalton hovered behind him, gray and silent. Red started singing as they walked off, but he changed the words. I'm dreaming of a white central. Mr. Dalton laughed. The colored man gripped his broom tighter and started sweeping yet again, but I could see the rage in his eyes.